Welcome back, everybody. Our last uh, speaker is Adrian Piper, that we are very honored to welcome here in Lausanne. Adrian Piper is a first generation conceptual artist who started exhibiting her work internationally at the age of, age of 20. She graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 69, received a BA in philosophy from the City College of New York in 74, and a PhD in philosophy from Harvard in 81. She studied Kant and Hegel with Dieter Henrich at the University of Heidelberg and taught philosophy full-time for 30 years with specializations in metaethics and Kant. Adrian Piper introduced issues of race and gender into the vocabulary of conceptual art and political content into minimalism. She also included a Vedic philosophical imagery and concepts in her work and practices yoga since 1965. Adrian Piper lives and works in Berlin, where she runs the APRA Foundation, and her artwork won the Golden Lion for Best Artist at the 56th Venice Biennale this year. Under the title, What Exactly is the Idea of Artistic Research? Adrian Piper's talk will address the distinction between artistic and traditional research, a distinction that might very well be based on misguided assumptions. Adrian Piper, the floor is yours. So everyone should have a handout. If anyone doesn't have a handout, please raise your hand and someone will bring you a handout. Okay, great. What exactly is the idea of artistic research? When the word research is used in the traditional academic context, it does not generate this question. Certainly the word has different applications in different fields. It may refer to field work for the cultural anthropologist, laboratory experiments for the chemist, studying original manuscripts for the historian, or reading the work of other philosophers for the philosopher. But there is no serious disagreement as to what all of these methods of acquiring information have in common. The OED says it best. Research is an investigation directed to the discovery of some fact by careful study of a subject, a course of critical or scientific inquiry. In what follows, I use the word research in this traditional sense. When artistic research is the topic, the term is not used in this sense because the very idea of artistic research is a recent one. Whenever I, find, I, whenever I try to find out what it means, I find evidence of an alarming Humpty Dumpty tendency to try to make the term mean whatever one wants it to mean. My aim here is to combat this tendency by ascertaining exactly to what, if anything, this term does or should refer. My method, is that of exegesis and analysis, as these are usually, usually practiced in philosophy, on two recent texts that express consensus on some ways in which the term artistic research is presently being used. Part one, artistic research as investigation. Passage A on your handout is from the Byrne Declaration by Professor Hans de Wolf of the Free University of Brussels. He says, the platform has taken the initiative to launch the Bern Declaration, a powerful answer to the unstructured and scattered nature of knowledge related to the arts, under the form of an online archive where existing and new material related to artistic research will be assembled and made available to all of us. Artists, partners, researchers with academic and artistic backgrounds, and not in the least to governments and decision makers. The material will come directly from historical sources, such as artists' journals, working notes, drafts, interviews, catalog te texts, manifestos, etc. The mission of the online archive is to provide a sustainable and interactive structure where existing and new material related to artistic research can be united, organized, and become available for partners from academic and artistic backgrounds. 
The material will consist of reflections by artists and non-artists on the notion of artistic research and the nature of creative processes. During the conference, each participant will be given 10 minutes for answering two questions. How would you define the notion of artistic research within your creative praxis? What is the impact of research as you defined it on the final product of your artistic creation? The given answers are expected to be diverse and wide-ranged, hence giving insight in the complexity of what is called research in the arts and creating an intellectual basis for an outline. In Clause A2, the term artistic research is introduced in scare quotes. These function to block the reader's natural assumption that the term has a well-defined referent and to alert the reader that this is a term of art, one that gestures at a disputed territory rather than pins down its boundaries. But we see from the rest of the passage that the term is meant to function as a banner for collecting and organizing historical sources such as artists' journals, working notes, drafts, interviews, catalog, es catalog texts, manifestos, etc., as well as existing and new material related to artistic research. This existing and new material will consist of reflections by artists and non-artists on the notion of artistic research and the nature of creative processes. These are all quotes from the text. So the material to be collected is of two kinds. First, texts and pronouncements already made that might finally qualify as artistic research once we have a firm grasp on what that is. And second, texts and pronouncements by artists and others self-consciously oriented toward elucidating what it is. Additionally, at the inaugural conference intended to launch the Berne Declaration, each participant has 10 minutes to explain how she would define the notion of artistic research within her creative praxis, and what is the impact of research as she defined it on the final product of her artistic creation. These explanations are intended to give insight in the complexity of what is called research in the arts, and create an intellectual basis for an outline. Thus, passage A uses the term artistic research as an operational tool for gathering empirical data. This data is then to be digested and organized in such a way as to provide insight into what the term means for each person who uses it. The resulting variety and complexity of responses is then to provide the basis for an outline. I take the desired outline to be a way of diagramming the areas of similarity and difference among the multiple ways in which the idea of artistic research is understood. The modus operandi described in passage A corresponds to the OED definition of investigating, which is to search or inquire into, to examine systematically or in detail, to make search, to reconnoiter, to scout, to inquire systematically. Whereas research presupposes a particular subject of inquiry, a course of study of it, and a specialized methodology for discovering new information within it, to which the investigation is directed. Investigation is, itself is a more general process of observing, inspecting, searching, or examining an area or territory systematically in order to understand its internal relations better. The aim of investigation, independent of the uses to which it may be put, is at once more diffuse and general, and also more modest. A detective's aim in investigating a crime scene is not to explain something, but rather to discover clues that indirectly enable him to explain something, namely who committed the crime. His investigation uncovers and clarifies the relations among the elements found in the crime scene environment. Similarly, passage A proposes to investigate the territory of artists' writings and pronouncements about their creative processes in order to ascertain what relation, if any, these might bear to an as yet unspecified idea of artistic research. 
It does not purport to define or collect or systematize artistic research. Rather, it proposes to collect and make available a body of relevant empirical data that can be inspected and surveyed for the purpose of clarifying in what artistic research consists. This is an important project. Without having a clearer and more comprehensive grasp of what artists actually do and take themselves to be doing, the question of whether or not it counts as artistic research cannot be answered. So the project proposed by the Byrne Declaration must form a necessary part of any serious attempt to answer it. However, as it stands, this project is only half the task. Just as important as consulting artists on their actual productive processes is consulting academics on theirs. Missing from the Byrne Declaration is a call for the extended and systematic methodological discussions with academics in fields for which the concept of research itself is clearly defined and deeply embedded. Indeed, epistemology and the history and philosophy of science already do contain substantive and relevant discussions of the varying methodologies of knowledge acquisition in these different areas of academic specialization. An investigation of this rich variety of methodologies in fields as different as history, mathematics, philosophy, economics, and physics also needs to be incorporated into the same empirical database and compared with the data provided by artists. These would provide both a foundation and a useful point of contrast against which the area of speci specifically artistic research could be delineated as different and unique if it is. To my knowledge, no such serious and extended cross-disciplinary comparative studies have yet taken place. This is surprising in an enterprise that aims to incorporate a well-defined term into a new educational context. Cross-disciplinary comparative inquiry, that is, research into the meaning and implications of the idea of artistic research, that respects and fulfills the requirements of comparative research as this concept is traditionally understood is necessary in order to construct a basis on which the concept of spe specifically artistic research can be validated, if it can be validated. This means that those who do this research must already know the methodologies of traditional social science research well enough in order to apply them to this inquiry. They must know how to find and gather data from other fields, how to analyze them, organize them, quantify them, sift them carefully for valid generalizations, and derive from these generalizations valid inferences for formulating administrative policy in fine arts higher education. The resulting policies should be able to answer at least the following fundamental questions. How much training and experience in the fundamentals of writing, that is composition, spelling, grammar, must be presupposed for academic study in any field? Should artistic researchers be required to format their discursive texts according to standard research conventions of reference, citation, footnoting, bibliographical compilation, and management of gender pronouns? What are the specialized research methodologies that distinguish the different fields in higher education? For example, laboratory experimentation, critical reasoning, textual exegesis, statistics, computation, proofs, field work, etc. And how much instruction and in what forms is required to master them? Which of these specialized methodologies is of most interest to advance practices in contemporary art making? Which ones should a doctoral program in fine art presuppose? And in which ones should it offer introductory or advanced training? What pr proportion of coursework should be devoted to traditional art making practice and what proportion, if any, to these other areas of instruction? How should such a program require its doctoral candidates to demonstrate proficiency in any of these areas before permitting them to embark on the dissertation? And so on. 
A program committed to artistic research that is too unfamiliar with the content, activities, and demands of other research fields to answer these questions appropriates a familiar term with a clear conventional meaning, meaning into a new context in which it has no definite meaning, but nevertheless establishes by fiat the professional status which these more traditional forms of research already have. The consequences for students enrolled in such a program are unlikely to be happy. Part two, artistic research as exploration. An attempt to address the issue of cross-disciplinary comparison lacking in passage A is undertaken in passage B, also on your handout. This comes from a recent promotional newsletter written by Carolyn Christoph Bakargiev, the artistic director of Documenta 13. She says, Documenta 13 is dedicated to artistic research and forms of imagination that explore commitment, matter, things, embodiment, and active living in connection with, yet not subordinated to, theory and epistemological closures. These are terrains where politics are inseparable from a sensuous, energetic, and worldly alliance between current research in various scientific and artistic fields and other knowledges, both ancient and contemporary. Documenta 13 is shared with and recognizes the shapes and practices of knowing of all the animate and inanimate makers of the world, including people. Participants of Documenta 13 come from a range of fields of activity. Most of them are artists, but some also come from the fields of science, including physics and biology, eco-architecture and organic agriculture, renewable energy research, philosophy, anthropology, economic and political theory, language and literature studies, including fiction and poetry. They contribute to Documenta 13 that aims to explore how different forms of knowledge lie at the heart of the active exercise of reimagining the world. Their acts, gestures, thoughts, and knowledges produce and are produced by circumstances that are readable by art, aspects that art can cope with and absorb. The conception of Documenta 13 described here is impressive for its inclusiveness and its willingness to invite participants from a range of fields of activity into mutual connection under circumstances that are readable by art, aspects that art can cope with and absorb. It correctly identifies contemporary art making as that specialized field most flexible and receptive to input from other such fields and therefore potentially the best site for cross-disciplinary dialogue. Yet passage B does not propose a topic of dialogue among the disciplines, nor does it acknowledge the methodological differences and similarities among them from which art-making practice can learn so much. For example, clause B1 aligns artistic research with forms of imagination in general, in that both explore commitment, matter, things, embodiment, and active living. A maximally wide range of physical and social states of affairs, intentional attitudes, and indeed sentience itself. But original work in all academic fields also depends on forms of imagination, whether visual, symbolic, linguistic, or schematic. Imagination is just that capacity of mind that constructs alternatives to the real. It is not the special preserve of the arts. Moreover, the use of the verb explore in clauses B1 and B10 implies an even more diffuse and generalized mode of inquiry than investigation. To explore something, according to the OED, is to seek out, to seek to find out to look into closely, scrutinize, to pry into, to probe, to search into, to go into or range over for the purpose of discovery. It encompasses both physical survey and manipulation 
and also anal analogous mental operations through which we probe the much wider area of imagination and intellection. Any state of affairs, whether mental or physical, can be an object of curiosity that invites us to explore it. Exploration is what a child does with a Lego set. It is what painters did with acrylic paint when this was first introduced as an alternative to oil painting in the 1960s. And it is what a philosopher does with an area of research, research that lays outside her specialization, but about which she is curious. Passage, passage B's use of the concept of exploration to anchor the idea of artistic research thus distances us even further from that of research itself. Whereas research presupposes a defined subject matter of inquiry and a specialized methodology for discovering new information within it, an investigation is a more general process of searching an area systematically in order to gain a better understanding of it. Exploration carries no necessary connotation of method, system, or even of a defined territory in which exploration is presumed to take place. Exploration of a thing or state of affairs is maximally open-ended with regard both to manner and to purpose. Its aim is to get acquainted with something, become personally familiar with it, discover its facets, whereas research aims at exp explanation and investigation aims at clarification. Exploration aims at discovery for its own sake. Passage B proposes to understand artistic research as a process of exploration of commitment, matter, things, embodiment, and active living. Call this proposal Thesis One. Thesis one can be interpreted either normatively or descriptively. If it is a normative claim, then it purports to define artistic research as exploration and to prescribe this as what artists ought to be doing when producing their work, namely exploring something in such a way as to learn it and yield discoveries about it. Since it would be silly to disqualify as artists those whose practices do not fulfill this prescription, the implication would have to be that not all artists engage in artistic research, and that those who do not, by definition, have a different kind of art-making practice. It then would be an open question, surely, as to whether these practices are thereby better or worse than those which do involve artistic research, and whether these other art-making practices would be improved or harmed by adhering more closely to the values of learning and discovery that characterize exploration, and therefore, on this interpretation, artistic research. Failure to notice that prescribing such a course of artistic research might not have an equally salutary effect on all art students may explain an experience I had recently while doing a visiting professorship at a highly regarded art academy committed to the idea of artistic research. My job was to individually critique the work of the program's MFA students. These were all intelligent, capable, well-read, and well-established in their creative practices. One showed me some very smart, powerful, sophisticated work, an ordered sequence of drawings and mock-ups of large, spare sculptural installations, an abstract mix of architecture and heroic minimalism founded in the principle of permutation. We had an amicable discussion about Bach, Beckett, Solowit, Hannah Darboven, Peter Eisenman, and other shared points of reference. He confessed that his professors were giving him trouble because, they complained, the work was not sufficiently well-researched. What do they want you to research, I asked. Whatever the work is about, he replied. But what exactly is it that they want you to do, I asked. I think they want me to read more write it up and report on it, he answered. I advised him to just do his work and worry about how to research it later. 
The more I thought about this exchange, the more it annoyed me. When criticizing student work, I take my responsibility to be to mirror back to the student the effects on me as an informed viewer of her practical choices in producing the work I see, and to challenge her to transgress her self-imposed aesthetic limitations. It is no part of that responsibility to communicate to the student that she is failing to meet some further ill-defined criterion for which the program offers no clear guidelines or training. On the well-established philosophical dictum that ought implies can, an advanced fine art program that prescribes artistic research as a value or standard it expects its students to meet is thereby obligated to issue precise instructions as to exactly what it is requiring them to do. It is also obligated to provide those students with the necessary means for meeting those requirements. Now the normative interpretation of thesis one implies that a graduate program in artistic research should provide its students with training specifically in how to explore. But it is difficult to imagine how such a program could be useful for artists. Someone who must be taught how to explore has not yet developed the skills necessary for becoming an artist in the first place. If, on the other hand, Thesis One's claim that artistic research is about exploration is a descriptive claim, then it purports to refer to what artists, in fact, already do in producing their work. If artistic research is an unrestricted process of exploration of a thing or state of affairs or material or configuration of ideas for its own sake, then an artist's process of producing his work is sufficient to instill its requirements and all artists engage in artistic research. There is then nothing further over and above the completion of this process in the final form of the work, which an artist needs to do in order to qualify as doing artistic research. Correspondingly, there are then no substantive changes any traditional art program curriculum must make in order to count as an artistic research program. Failure to address this implication of the descriptive interpretation of thesis one may explain a second experience I had while doing another visiting professorship at a different, highly regarded art academy, this one with an acclaimed doctoral program in fine art. Several of the students in this program had gone on to stellar careers in the international art world. The only problem was that 10 or more years after leaving the academy, they still had not completed its degree requirements. In particular, they were having trouble completing the written text portions of their dissertations. Upon further questioning, it transpired that many of the students in this program were having similar problems. All were highly trained in the production techniques of different fine art media and knowledgeable about art criticism and theory but none had studied writing or composition in, comparable, in compar compa comparable depth. In conversation, some spoke brilliantly about the ideas that motivated their artwork, while others were very reluctant to talk about them at all. I saw that my role in many cases was to suggest concrete strategies for transforming their spoken conversation about their work into clear and consistent discursive prose. In other cases, my role was to get them to talk or write about it in the first place. Mostly my suggestions were about how to become fluent at writing, by reading a lot and by writing every day, by practicing the skill of writing, just as, they, just as they had already practiced the skills of drawing or welding or video editing. Over dinner conversation with my colleagues who administered the program, I learned that the students were not graded on their work. I asked, then how do they know whether they are doing well in the program or not? They replied, you can't grade a work of art. I sensed that my colleagues were torn between two equally compelling but seemingly incompatible imperatives. 
On the one hand, they wanted to protect each student's creative process and nurture her uniquely original artistic output, as art academies traditionally do. On the other, they wanted to impose further discursive written requirements that would have needed a grading system to be viable in order to meet traditional dissertation demands that are taken for granted in the academic world. This is the dilemma that specialized art academies confront. In art departments that are nested in traditional academic liberal arts institutions, the dilemma is often exactly the opposite. How to encourage art majors to produce genuinely daring and innovative artwork while at the same time observing the academic standards with which they are already comfortable. By contrast with art academy students, liberal arts institutions, art students, are usually fluent in writing and discoursing on their work and in researching the issues it raises. Their problem is that the work itself is often so inhibited and conservative that it does not raise many issues to research or write about. Just as art academies are experiencing difficulties in introducing academic dissertation requirements, similarly academic institutions often find it hard to motivate their art majors to produce the quality of cutting edge work necessary for a successful career in the international art world. Now the descriptive claim that artists in fact engage in an unrestricted process of exploration in producing their work is a testable empirical hypothesis. To test it, we can examine the data on artists' actual practices collected under the Byrne Declaration and ascertain to what extent these practices include exploration as defined by the OED. But such an investigation is not likely to show the descriptive interpretation of thesis one to be interestingly true because the empirical data probably will not show artistic exploration to be both necessary and sufficient for artistic production. Of course, an artist's creative process includes exploration of materials, ideas, media, literature, history, science, other artists' work, and whatever else interests the artist in the process of producing his own work. But for this very reason, an artist's creative process surely cannot be characterized in terms of exploration alone, nor claim to exclude other more focused or specialized forms of inquiry as well. Every artist's creative process is as different, unique, and complex as the work she makes. And every artist strives to learn the specialized techniques, methods, and data, whatever they are, that enable him to produce his work. The problem with thesis one, on both normative and descriptive interpretations, is that it is too reductive. However, the descriptive interpretation of thesis one also implies that the particular kind of knowledge yielded by artistic research is the knowledge an artist, any artist, acquires simply by producing her work. And there is surely a great deal of truth to this. She discovers her own creative process. She learns how to manipulate the materials she chooses. She learns on what basis she makes aesthetic or strategic choices as to the final form of the work and how to distinguish among them. She discovers the possibilities and limitations of this way of working with these materials, under these circumstances, as guided by these formal choices. And in presenting the work in its final form to a viewer, she educates the viewer by presenting the viewer with these discoveries about the possibilities and limitations inherent in the exploratory process that produced it. All art does, in fact, have this didactic function of offering the viewer a new configuration of ideas, materials, and circumstances that has not been experienced before. Part three, artistic research as knowledge.
A second thesis propounded by passage B directly addresses the cross-disciplinary comparison. It maintains that the relationship between artistic and traditional research is one in which free-floating exploration and the satisfaction of curiosity are the independent equals of specialized inquiry and the formulation of an explanatory theory. It describes artistic research as being in connection with, yet not subordinated to, theory and epistemological closures, and as standing in a political relationship of worldly alliance, that is a relationship in which power and resources are negotiated and exchanged between artists and academics. Call this thesis two. Thesis two states that artistic research qua exploration is in polit political connection and alliance with, but not subordinate to, fields of traditional academic research in the natural and social sciences, liberal arts, and humanities. Thesis two implies that both the kind of exploration that is claimed to characterize artistic research and also the methodologies of traditional academic research each have something of value to offer the other, despite the divergence in their respective approaches. Passage B depicts the process of unrestricted exploration that characterizes artistic research <coughs> as no less significant or valuable than the highly focused and systematic methodologies of the natural and social sciences and humanities. It justifies this claim to parity of status by describing artistic research as one of many shapes and practices of knowing, one of many different forms of knowledge. And it describes artistic research as only one among the range of fields of activity, which also include that of science, fiction, and poetry. Thus, passage B proposes to situate artistic research conceived as a process of exploration, as a legitimate form of knowledge, equal in status to academic ones, and indeed one that is flexible and encompassing enough to cope with and absorb these other forms of knowledge. Whether or not this line of reasoning is independently plausible, it does not work as a justification of thesis two because neither traditional research nor untrammeled exploration is itself knowledge. At best, both are processes for the acquisition of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? At the end of a successful course of traditional research, a trained academic knows new observational data or new theories that explain them. He achieves epistemological closure. Similarly, at the end of a course of untrammeled exploration, an explorer knows more intimately the territory or state of affairs she has explored. She is familiar with more of its facts and facets, including new or previously unnoticed ones. By climbing Mount Everest for the first time, Sir Edmund Hillary discovered new facets of Mount Everest that no one else had experienced. Because of his exploration, he became a specialist on Mount Everest and was in a position to instruct others on how to get there, what they would find there, how to protect themselves against the elements while underway, and so on. But there was no explanatory theory he wished to test nor any observational data he wished to collect in the service of such a theory. Becoming familiar with Mount Everest was an end in itself. Nevertheless, there certainly is a sense in which what he learned by exploring could cope with and absorb other more specialized forms of knowledge, which he also learned by exploring. For example, he probably knew everything there is to know about weather forecasting hiking equipment, and how to treat frostbite and altitude sickness. He probably spoke fluent vernacular Tibetan and Nepalese. And he probably knew local social custom at a level that would have proved illuminating to a cultural anthropologist. 
The distinction between the knowledge derived from exploration and the knowledge derived from traditional research lends itself well to Bertrand Russell's distinction between knowing how and knowing that, between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. But it is sufficient for my purposes that there is a difference between the kind of knowledge produced by research and the kind of knowledge produced by exploration, even if, as in this example, one leads to the other and both are intertwined in a single process. If these two forms of knowledge are different, then the mere fact that they are both forms of knowledge produced by research and exploration respectively is not sufficient for inferring that research and exploration have the same status, nor therefore that artistic research and academic research have the same status. The forms of knowledge claim of clauses B4, B5, B10, and B11 does not justify thesis two. But could thesis two be true nevertheless? Could artistic research qua exploration be a form of knowledge acquisition that is equal in status to those of the traditional academic disciplines? Intuitively, it is very hard to see how this could possibly be right. Unrestricted exploration of a thing, territory, or state of affairs is not equal in status to academic research, but is rather a necessary precondition of it. No academic in any field, no respectable academic in any field, could possibly produce original research without first engaging in precisely this type of exploration, any more than any artist could produce art without it. Passage B arrogates exploration to artistic research and forms of imagination and contrasts it with theory and epistemological closures to which exploration is claimed to be in connection but not subordinate. As though exploration were the exclusive preserve of artists, whereas theory and epistemological closures were the exclusive preserve of academics. This stipulated division of labor is simplistic. For example, how would thesis two account for the process Descartes describes in the Discourse on Method, which he introduces as follows. As for myself, I have never supposed that my mind was above the ordinary, but, but I do not hesitate to claim the good fortune of having stumbled in my youth upon certain paths which led me to, to certain considerations and maxims from which I formed a method of gradually increasing my knowledge and of improving my abilities as much as the mediocrity of my talents and the shortness of my life will permit. I resolved to seek no other knowledge than that which I might find within myself or perhaps in the great book of nature. I spent a few years of my adolescence traveling, seeing courts and armies, living with people of diverse types and stations of life, acquiring varied experiences, testing myself in the episodes which fortune sent me, and above all, thinking about the things around me so that I could derive some profit from them. The greatest profit to me was, therefore, that I became acquainted with customs generally approved and accepted by other great peoples that would appear extravagant and ridiculous among ourselves. And so I learned not to believe too firmly what I learned only from example and custom. Also, I gradually freed myself from many errors which could obscure the light of nature and make us less capable of correct reasoning. But after spending several years in thus studying the book of nature and acquiring experience, I eventually reached the decision to study my own self and to employ all my abilities to try to choose the right path. If these deeply philosophical passages do not express a form of imagination that explores commitment, matter, things, embodiment, and active living, it is hard to adduce a text that would. In this intellectual autobiography, Descartes describes a process in which 
blind discovery, exploration, experimentation, methodological formulation, investigation, experience, reasoning, learning, self-critique, and study are inextricably connected. And how would Thesis II explain away Kant's claim in the preface to the first edition of the Crit Critique of Pure Reason? He says, it is a call to reason to undertake anew the most difficult of all of its tasks, namely that of self-knowledge. I have entered upon this path, the only one that has remained unexplored, and flatter myself that in following it, I have found a way of guarding against all those errors which have hitherto set reason in its non-empirical employment at variance with itself. I have specified these questions exhaustively according to principles, and after locating the point at which through misunderstanding, reason comes into conflict with itself, I have solved them to its complete satisfaction. In this passage, too, Kant depicts himself, accurately, as an explorer, an investigator, and a problem solver. These two descriptions of the creative process in philosophy make clear that differing modes of inquiry cannot be so easily apportioned to different disciplines as Thesis II suggests. Finally, if exploration is what artists do, how does Thesis II explain what first-year college students do when they take electives in a variety of disciplines in order to find out what they enjoy doing or are good at doing, or because they are curious about what one does in such a discipline? In all three of these counterexamples, exploration is the foundation of a thinker's creative process. And this can be extended to every field in which original work is produced. The assumption that exploration, and indeed creativity for that matter, differentiates artists from other thinkers is simply misguided. Conversely, the assumption that research and specialized methods of knowledge acquisition differentiate academics from artists is equally misguided. I have already argued that artists learn whatever specialized techniques and methodologies they need to learn in order to get their work done to the extent they need or want to learn them. This claim too can be generalized. Specialized research methodologies are no more the exclusive preserve of academics than creative exploration is the exclusive preserve of artists. So it is worth asking whether this very widely accepted division of labor respects the realities of creative work in any field, and why so many of us on both sides of the fence are so quick to accept it. For thesis two hardly originates with passage B. We have already seen that the Art Academy colleagues I described earlier implicitly accept it as well. Many of my academic colleagues also concur with this fallacious depiction of their own creativity. In moments of despair, they sometimes represent their own disciplines as dry, rigid, stuffy, and overly regulated by deeply ingrained professional convention. Whereas art, they think, is the realm in which you can do whatever crazy stuff you like. Stuff a hog, stud it with sequins, and dunk it in formaldehyde, or strip, coach yourself and your denuded friends in nothing but bright blue paint, thrash around on the floor, and film it. But surely this is no worse than Diogenes' theatrical tactic of living in a bathtub, or Bertrand Russell's of being stripped of his professorship at the City College of New York for writing a book about sex as though philosophers exercise no creativity or forms of imagination in producing their theories, and as though creativity had only to do with making objects, whereas academic research was about hunching over a computer. Something like this simplistic view fueled some reactions I recently received after publishing a harsh, harsh critique of an eminent senior philosophy colleague's self-proclaimed stylistic experiment. 
I objected to its replacing analytic philosophy's distinctive method of analysis and evaluation of philosophical arguments with ad hominem snipes at their author's personal lifestyles. I argued that this experiment violated essential standards of philosophical analysis that had stood the test of time for more than two millennia. Some philosophy colleagues censured me for this. One commented that it was easy for me to reject literary creativity and philosophy because I already had an outlet for my own creativity in making art. It was suggested that I should be more generous in allowing other philosophers the same freedom. Now, of course, there is a clear sense in which artists, in fact, do much crazier stuff in art than academics do in philosophy or physics or economics. But that is not because art making is creative and free, whereas academic research is method methodical and cramped. It is because the specialized methods, obligations, and standards of achievement are different. The creative process in each arena is challenged, uh, challenged channeled, sorry, is channeled differently according to the different goals, training, and practice the field instills. In art education, we learn both by doing our own work and by study, studying art history that it is our calling and our obligation as artists to do crazy stuff. That is what we are paid for. And it is a serious error to suppose that there is no method in our madness. What do you suppose we are learning in all those years of intensive art academy training? It takes considerable psychological conditioning and inculcation of professional norms, as well as persistent practice and schooling in the history, methods, strategies, and tactics of aesthetic innovation to produce an art academy graduate who is fit to do the really crazy stuff required of him by his professional commitment to art. This process of inquiry and production is no less highly specialized than the methodology of any other field. It is just different, and the cognitive chasm that divides artists from academics is one of mutual incomprehension. But that is the natural result of specialization. In all such cases, only your colleagues understand what you are talking about, or in the case of art making, what you are doing. All creative thinkers in all fields of specialization in higher education, exploration, investigation, and research in their work at different points, as they need to and as the work demands it. An institution, whether artistic or academic, that meddles with the creativity of its students or faculty by imposing on its final form invasive external requirements that fail to respect the intrinsic imperatives of the work strangles the innovation and growth that justify its existence. So although artists certainly do have equal status with academics in these respects, there is no determinate content to the idea of artistic research that conveys it. Part four, artistic research as research. Although I have not been able to locate a determinate referent for the idea of artistic research, I do believe that some artistic processes are naturally inclined towards study and inquiry, that is, to research. This is the legacy of conceptual art. A good doctoral program in fine art will cultivate and refine this inclination in a direction that informs and supports the artwork. Learning to write fluently and clearly and to read carefully are particularly important because, because conventional language is the bridge that connects the idiosyncratic personal language of an artwork with the unpredictable variety of background assumptions its audience brings to viewing it. But that connection is strengthened even more by artist-authored discursive texts that illuminate the significance of the work. Doctoral programs in fine art should encourage this engagement. 
So in closing, I shall try to extract and summarize some suggestions for building a well-functioning doctoral program in fine art from what I have said so far. Here I want to emphasize that I have no personal or professional stake in or connection to any such program. But I have attended three art academies and three universities and taught at six more before getting kicked out of the field of academic philosophy for going a bit too far with the crazy art stuff. So I hope these suggestions will be useful. One, cross-disciplinarity. Take the initiative in cultivating and facilitating strong collegial ties with other academic departments and institutions through participation in joint symposia and presentations, as well as on committees with cross-disciplinary themes and purposes. Two, research. Require your students to do research in the, in the traditional sense in whatever academic field of specialization enriches and informs the student's work. This research should include proficiency in reading and writing at its foundation, but it should build on that foundation with the advanced data and methods of inquiry characteristic of the chosen field. Three, research training. Make available to your doctoral candidates the educational resources and training necessary to achieve both proficiency in reading and writing and also research competence in the candidate's chosen academic specialization. This can be done either through alliance with a neighboring academic institution or should your program itself be located in such an institution through alliance with neighboring academic departments. Four, research qualification. Require proof of research competence in the candidate's chosen academic specialization in advance of embarking on the dissertation. This can be achieved through a qualifying written exam or a research paper or a passing grade of at least B plus in an advanced level academic course taught by a specialist in the field. Five, grading. Grade your students' art-making coursework according to the same standards of aesthetic quality and achievement we apply when rank ordering artist grant applications on a funding panel. Grading is a reality in all fields, and it can only help art students to know where they stand relative to their instructor's expectations. Six, supplementing the program. Do not I repeat, do not cut back on any of your art practice course offerings, faculty, or resources in order to accommodate these academic requirements. Art education in a fine arts doctoral program should be just as varied, intensive, and rigorous as that in the most highly specialized art academy. If you want a good program, your institution must find a way to fund the additional years of study needed to meet these additional requirements. Seven, latitude in the written text. Require your doctoral candidates to produce a written text of at least 10,000 words that is scholarly and discursive in nature. Encourage these candidates to incorporate meta-art commentary, discussion, and analysis of their own artwork and particularly of the artwork offered in fulfillment of the doctorate into this text. However, do not require such a personal connection between the written text and the artwork. An objective scholarly discussion that is thematically related to the artwork or that informs or sheds light on it or that is part of it or that provides a background theoretical or scientific context for the artwork should also be permitted and encouraged. Eight, clarity. Finally, no student in your program should be confused about exactly what is being required of her. Thanks, and good luck. <laughs>